So welcome everyone to this uh, UK Catalysa special webinar. Um, and it's my great pleasure to um, welcome the chemical science group of the UK Excel team um, to speak about um, Excel and chemical sciences. And I will hand straight over to Professor John Rango to tell you more about what's coming up. Okay, great. Let me uh, start by sharing my screen. It worked a moment ago, so it should work again now. Um, I hope you can see my screen and I'm going to go into slideshow mode. So let me first of all introduce you to who we are. We're, we're, we're from the UK XFL science team. So we were among the people responsible for developing the science case and the ongoing development of the science case. And the people speaking today are from the chemical sciences group of that science team. Um, if you want to know more about that, I'll point to a website where you can find out more about the, the process uh, uh, toward the end. So what we're going to do is split this into five different sub presentations to try and introduce you to the opportunities in chemical sciences with uh, XFELs in general, but also next generation XFELs in particular. So I'm going to just begin with a general intro introdu introduction about what XFELs are and what they can do. And then Rebecca Ingle will talk about X-ray probing of chemical dynamics. Julia Weinstein will talk about opportunities in ultrafast dynamics of electron and energy transfer. Andrew Burnett will then talk, talk us through some of the op opportunities that exist using terahertz and IR activation of chemical dynamics. And then Tom Penfold will, um, will uh, explore for us uh, some of the theoretical tools for X-ray spectroscopy and chemical dynamics. So basically, um, current XFELs and, and the ones that are envisaged for the near future are based on this process called self-amplified spontaneous emission or SASE. Um, and the process is reliant on having a high quality relativistic electron beam, uh, which is then passed through um, a magnetic undulator, alternating poled magnetic field structure, many of these. Um, and in that process, uh, radiation is emitted from the electron bunch and a back reaction on the electron bunch occurs, which causes a micro bunching. And that then leads further down the chain of undulators to coherent emission um, at a frequency determined by the undulator period. But it's not the undulator period as in the lab frame, which is around a centimeter. It's actually the undulator period relativistically shifted um, uh, to, to give us uh, essentially X-ray emission of, of light. So this is why we can generate um, short pulses of coherent light from the softer hard X-rays with very high brightness uh, from a SASE based XFL. So what does that give us? That gives us X-rays from 10 EV or much, much smaller photon energy than that if you're building an IRX, uh, IR fell um, to greater than 100, to, 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 to greater than 10 keV photon energies. In other words, from 100 nanometers to something less than 0.1 of a nanometers in wavelength. The pulses can be less than 10 femtoseconds. I'll show you at the end, less than a femtosecond is possible with unprecedented brightness. And two X-ray pulses synchronized together or two, an X-ray pulse synchronized to external lasers allow for pump probe studies that allow us to study dynamics. Now, the current generation of uh, SASE XFELs give us essentially rather stochastic fields. They're quite noisy. They're not, they're not um, single mode fields. Oops, um, we've got a bit of problem there. Not like that. Um, uh, they're not yet fully coherent, but recent advances in seeding and in implementation of enhanced SASE, among others, uh, are looking to deliver transform limited fields, X-ray fields in the near future. So the main overwhelming use case uh, for uh, XFELs is to access real-time dynamics and access the processes and fluctuations that occur in matter at the quantum scale. So here's a, a sort of a, a chart uh, going from sub femtosecond time scales all the way up to a microsecond time scales, indicating the sorts of processes that we're, we're thinking of. We're talking about electron dynamics, both valence and in a shell. We're talking about primary photo excitation events. We're talking about vibronic uh, coupling time scales, lattice dynamics, exciton dynamics, um, Rovabronic uh, coupling timescales, all happening in the femtosecond or sub femtosecond up to few picosecond timescales. And 
Other X-ray sources, for instance, synchrotrons, do not permit us to access these very fast timescales. Typically, they stop being uh, really useful tools below about a 10 or 100 picosecond temporal resolution. And so for that, if one wants to study using X-ray techniques, really fast dynamics, one needs to go to an x -fel. So essentially, x files are x files are are targeting then this uh, tens of picoseconds down to sub femtosecond timescale dynamics that previously have not been available uh, to X-ray study. So already the world has a significant number of, of XFL facilities, um, five or six hard X-ray facilities and a number of soft X-ray VUV facilities. The first of these to operate was LCLS in Stanford and then Sackler in Japan in about 2011. And then more recently, European XFL came on stream in 2017. Swiss fell around the same time and Korean PAL XFL around that time. There's other machines planned. Um, Shine in, Ch in Shanghai is on track and also uh, the upgrade to LCLS, the LCLS2, which is a higher rep rate version of LCLS, is, 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 is ready to operate uh, fairly soon. So already these have produced a lot of exciting science, but our brief uh, in the science team uh, for this UK XFL project was to look at, well, what future opportunities uh, could open up with, with, with predicted improvements in XFL performance. And, and we'll summarize what those are uh, in a moment. But first of all, maybe I should say a few words about the sorts of measurements one does with these uh, machines. Um, in trouble with my controls here. Hold on a second. Yeah. Um, the primary um, enabling measurement techniques for X-rays, X-ray scattering and X-ray spectroscopy. And both of them give um, a wealth of nanoscopic information about materials and structures and structural dynamics if one applies them with time resolution. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details of, of how X-ray spectroscopy works or how X-ray diffraction and scattering work. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more about those as we progress. But the idea when you have short pulses of X-rays is you can apply X-ray X-ray scattering measurements or X-ray spectroscopy measurements in a pump probe uh, methodology. So essentially your sample is first excited by a pump, which gets the dynamics moving it. So it activates the, 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 the dynamics of interest. And then you come in at a delayed time with the probe and that allows you uh, to, to probe uh, using these incisive X-ray methodologies, X-ray scattering, X-ray spectroscopy, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, et cetera, to really learn about the evolution of the structure and of the electronic structure in time uh, with, with high temporal and, 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 and obviously spatial resolution. So here's some examples from our own work on work of Imperial College Group in, in uh, collaboration with both Slack and with DESI, um, where we've looked at at a second electron hole dynamics in X-ray ionized amino phenol. So here we're using sub femtosecond X-ray pulses um, near transform limited 300 at a second pulses in this case to probe using a, an X-ray absorption methodology that sh which our group first developed and comparing with B spline ADC electronic uh, dynamics calculations, um, uh, the dynamics that happen if you, um, the primary dynamics that happen in a molecular cat cation immediately after X-ray ionization. So the pump and the, the pump and probe pulses are both sub subfemtosecond sub second X-ray pulses. And on the frame in the, on the left, you can see the measured results from the most recent data. This is still unpublished, so this is still under analysis, but essentially you see very fast initial dynamics. The whole initially um, uh, migrates away from its original uh, location, then comes back again and then does some other stuff, which we're trying to fully understand. And, and actually the, the calculations show something rather similar, uh, qualitatively similar occurring. Now, in other measurements we were involved in with Tim Larman's group at DESI, we looked at the uh, glycine molecule and, and saw evidence for initially fast electronic oscillations, uh, 
followed by coupling to vibronic states. So this is sort of evidence of what one might call atochemistry. You start with purely electronic superposition states, which drive then uh, vibrational states and the motion of the nuclei. And, and, and so that, that I think is, a, is an important demonstration of what's possible and, and, and leads or has impact on a wide range of areas of interest in chemical and physical sciences, including understanding radiation damage in materials and biology, um, understanding the fundamentals of chemical dynamics, how, how, how you go beyond the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, testing computational quantum chemistry, and also in a lot of settings that are relevant to, to us, like atmospheric and astronomical, astrophysical uh, chemistry settings, where, uh, where uh, short pulses of, of very high brightness may actually interact with our molecules. And then finally, on uh, uh, understanding ultrafast dynamics of quantum coherence, entanglement, and the possibilities for quantum con control. So anyway, let me now switch to what we want to build um, in the UK or what we're considering building in the UK, which is a next generation capability, going beyond what's already available and, and, and or building on what's already available to, to give us uh, unique uh, uh, ca new capabilities that can impact further science. So one of those um, unique capabilities will be transform limited operation across the entire x-ray range and across a range of pulse durations not just attoseconds but also tens of femtoseconds so one can get high energy resolution simultaneously very importantly from the point of view of of science output is uh, a high efficiency science facility one running with a high repetition rate primary electron beam that will allow multiple end stations to be used simultaneously through beam switching so we envisage maybe a megahertz uh, electron beam rate and switching that simultaneously to 10 different end stations at a time so one can envisage doing 10 20 30 experiments a week uh, in a mode similar to the operational mode of a synchrotron so that greatly improves efficiency of output and cost effectiveness um, we're looking at a machine that has an evenly spaced high rep rate pulse structure that matches samples and detectors optimally um, at improving synchronization and timing data with external lasers to better than one femtosecond and also multiple color x-rays at one end station and uh, and, and that's a, quite an important uh, uh, capability and a full array of synchronized sources xuv to terahertz electron beams high power and high energy lasers at high rep rate and uh, and 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 really uh, having a very extensive range of, um, of 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 synchronized sources in particular and Andrew will talk more about this, the terahertz and infrared um, sources are pretty relevant to chemical dynamics as they are to a number of uh, applications in quantum materials and condensed phase physics. Uh, so the, the project at the moment uh, is, uh, is a conceptual design and options analysis. It, it started in October last year. It will run until October 2025. And the objective is to explore a conceptual design for a unique new machine that can fulfill all the required capabilities and more. And that's been led by a team uh, under Jim Clark at the Disbury Laboratory. And they've already made some stunning progress in, in conceptualizing this machine. And we're in, in discussion now with them about how that matches the science need. Um, and also examining other options, other investment options, including those at existing XFELs. And uh, to, to build uh, the updated science case that we're going to publish at the same time as the conceptual design, um, we are uh, developing a number of meetings around the country. So I'm going to come back to those right at the end. And now I'm going to stop sharing and hand on to my colleague, Rebecca Ingle, who's going to tell you more about the chemical dynamics possibilities. Great. Thanks a lot, John. So, see my slides okay? Yes, look good. Great, thanks. Um, cool. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to sort of talk a little bit about, you know, what do we mean by chemical dynamics? Why is it useful? And um, why might it be relevant to sort of your kind of work using the kind of methods and, and study approaches that, that we use in the field? So chemical dynamics is really all about getting atomistic level pictures of how chemical reactions happen. 
And that might be a sort of unimolecular process that's driven by light. It might be a more traditional chemical reaction between multiple species. It might be some kind of catalytic event. But really what we want to be able to resolve in these experiments is exactly what the nuclei do, exactly what the electrons do. And if you like, what we want to be able to do is really map out the full potential energy surface involved in a reaction with the hope that we can then design molecules that have really, really tailored properties to sort of affect how they traverse this surface. For example, um, in these kinds of experiments, we want to also be able to get quantitative information. So if we know we make a couple of different products down here, maybe we want to favor the, the formation of one product over another. So what do we have to do to the molecule to, to tailor it sort of in that way? But if you like, the dream experiment for us is really making a true molecular movie of how chemical reactivity occurs. And of course, this is chemical dynamics as well. So we don't want to just you know, work out what the nuclei and the um, electrons do. We want to work out how fast they do it as well. And that's where really having access to these, these ultra fast techniques is so important for us. We often think of um, processes in chemistry and catalysis and biology as being slow, right? Very often a chemical reaction takes several hours for a significant amount of product to build up. But the individual reactive steps, that bond breaking, bond formation, is all really happening on these sort of femtosecond timescales. And so we need techniques that give us access um, to that sort of um, regime as well. Um, so that's sort of a, a, an illustration of some of the kind of uh, questions we can ask. We can, of course, I'm a, I'm a molecular spectroscopist by trade. I mostly work with, um, you know, liquids and, and gases, but all of the kind of, um, you know, techniques I'll be talking about today, while you'll see a lot of prejudices in my language about the way I describe these, can be applied to um, sort of single crystals and thin films and, and solid materials as well. So they're, they're certainly not unique to this because these techniques also give us the, the opportunity to look at environmental effects. So that might be traditional um, doing sort of homogeneous catalysis and solution. We can also do more exotic environments like trapping molecules and optical cavities and all sorts of things. So it all really comes down to answering this question of what do the electrons and nuclei do during, during an overall reaction? So, okay, why are X-rays, and I'll get onto why x specifically, um, are good for looking at um, chemical dynamics sort of problems? Well, I think the, um, this example here of a, um, a protein, this is cytochrome C oxidase, illustrates this quite well. So this is an example of a metalloprotein. So we've got um, basically a, a heme site, an iron porphyrin in the middle of all this big complex organic shrubbery, as I like to call this. And if you want to try and work out what the, the chromophore in this system does in response to light, um, very often you're asking the question of, well, what, what's happening to the valence electrons, right? It's usually valence electrons that we're interested in in chemistry. And you can do those experiments. We have lots of nice lab-based optical methods now. But when you do, you get data that looks a little bit like this. And basically what we can very easily tell from this data is, yes, something happens in response to light. It happens over a certain time scale. But where things start to get tricky is when we say, well, what are those changes and how do they relate to the molecular structure? Am I looking at changes in the oxidation state of the iron here? Am I looking at some kind of deformation of the overall electronic structure of the protein? This can be really, really quite difficult to back out in these experiments, particularly for larger, more complex molecules. Um, I mean, I love these methods. I do them myself. But we really do very often suffer, um, particularly for bigger systems, with this problem I call of spectral congestion. Now, with an X-ray method, um, I mean, many of you will probably already be made very familiar with the advantage of X-ray techniques. With X-ray techniques, we, we sort of maybe lose some of the, the sensitivity we have of optical methods, but what we really gain in is selectivity. By picking the right edge and picking the right atom, we can get sort of experimental data that we know comes from changes in a specific atom or a specific site in the molecule. Um, for example, here is some iron K, K edge um, X-ray emission, and we can um, we sort of know enough about these time resolved methods and these sort of spectral line shape changes that we can also associate them with particular phenomena like spin state changes and oxidation state changes. 
And so x-rays are really, really nice because um, we can, as I say, we can really sort of deconvolute these sometimes quite complex um, chemical problems, which opens up the sort of chemical space we can work in in terms of complexity. Now, again, many of you will be familiar with the sort of zoo of x-ray techniques out there. There are probably as many x-ray techniques as there are x-ray scientists to some extent. But what I'm going to do is just group these into sort of three families of methods, these very crude groupings. We have x-ray absorption experiments, um, and these are where we take a core electron and we promote it to some unoccupied orbital. And these methods are quite nice because they allow us to look at changes in both the core and the valence electronic structure of a system, um, particularly in this sort of what we call very often called the Nexus region. We can also use absorption spectroscopies to get structural um, information. That's the sort of family of XAFs methods. And people are doing these techniques time resolved now at, at X-ray free electron lasers. So this is no longer just restricted to sort of static synchrotron measurements. Then we have the family of X-ray emission me methods. This might be looking at X-ray fluorescence, which is common for the hard X-ray techniques, but it might also be looking at ejection of photoelectrons. And emission methods are great because they tell you something about the behavior of your occupied um, electronic levels. Then you have scattering and diffraction and scattering and diffraction are really king, if you like, when you really want to work out what the nuclei are doing. These are probably the best techniques for looking at, at geometric changes um, in molecules as well. And we can also now sort of, when it comes to sort of solution phase examples, we can also do time resolved um, experiments where we look at how not just the molecule and the solute changes, but also how the solvent environment changes and how the structure or rearrangements happen there. And um, so there's lots and lots of possibilities. Of course, there's a million variants of all of these techniques, you know, wide angle scattering, uh, small angle scattering, bricks, uh, resonant OJ and things like that. There's also imaging variations of many of, this, of these techniques where the spatial information can be combined with the, with the spectroscopy. And um, so there's lots and lots of possibilities out there that you can sort of tailor for the specific um, questions that you're interested in. And the reason that we're sort of very excited about both, you know, existing and these future sort of X-ray free electron capabilities for chemical dynamics is simply because they're one of the few, few tools we have that one work in this sort of unique regime of short pulses, but also very, very bright pulses. I, I never like talking in absolutes in science, but I think, I think we can fairly confidently say that they are really the only tools that we have that can do both sort of sub 100 femtoseconds and give us the number of photons that we can do, particularly across the full um, range of photon energies from the soft X-ray to the hard X-ray. And the other thing that's quite exciting for sort of, you know, uh, chemists and whatever is, that this uh, peak brightness is also very, very useful if you want to measure dilute samples, right? Uh, often we want to look at gases and liquids, and that means that we need to use techniques that have good um, limits of detection, because let's face it, most samples you're not going to be able to dissolve a couple of kilograms in a litre. We're usually talking about concentrations in the, the millimolar to micromolar regime. Um, and so it's really, really useful to have lots of photons um, when you want to be able to do those kinds of experiments. The other thing that's really nice about x is, as I say, the diversity of techniques. Um, there's lots of new um, capabilities coming as well for multiplexing techniques. So you can do scattering and emission simultaneously and things like that. And just the general tunability of these machines. So, you know, if you want to go and do a single experiment, you can think about looking at different, say, metal edges or, or, or like a, a sort of soft x-ray edge, hard x-ray edge. You can look at the chemical dynamics from different perspectives. We can also do things like play with polarizations. Um, you know, circular polarization is really quite easy to generate in many of these facilities, which opens up, you know, new possibilities for studying chiral molecules. So they're really, really nice tools. And I'm just going to show you just one quick example before Julia really sort of showcases um, the more specific scientific questions we can address with these tools of this um, bimetallic complex with ruthenium and co cobalt. So this system is an example of a, an optical uh, sort of a molecular wire. So you have an optical chromophore at one end, you excite that, and an electron gets sort of shuffled through the system to the cobalt site. But what I like about this is it kind of shows you how all of these techniques work together in conjunction to give you a full picture of the chemical dynamics. 
So here we have time resolved X-ray emission that's being used to give us information on the spin state of the cobalt. We have um, what's called here time resolved X-ray liquidography. It's really X-ray scattering. And it tells you about the structural changes in the ligands in response to that electron movement, as well as energy transfer and relaxation to the solvent. And we can use optical techniques to fill in some of the um, information about the behavior of the optically bright chromophore. So even in a complex system like this, we can still really get out this atomic level information um, with this family of methods. We can work out how fast it all happens. And as I said before, you can do you can multiplex some of these experiments as well. And there's a nice sort of uh, review paper here if you want to find out a little bit more about um, X-ray scattering in solution and some of the possibilities there. And so with that, I'm going to hand over to Julia, who's going to tell you a little bit more about um, uh, sort of some of the possibilities, particularly sort of for chemistry um, that these tools are going to enable. So whenever you're ready. Uh, good afternoon. I'll try and share. Share. It's thinking. <laughs> it looks good. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, that looks perfect. Uh, one thing I never know the Zoom is whether the top panel can be hidden. Um, right. Yes. So, Rebecca, thanks for uh, the overview of the methods and um, I'll just go through some of the examples. Uh, of atomic scale movies that we are interested in recording. I'm Julia Weinstein, I'm a physical chemist working in Sheffield, and I'm a recent convert to ultrafast X-ray methods uh, from exclusively optical methods that we've been using for many years. So why do we want X-files? Because we want to have ultrafast structural electronic and spin dynamics in the same experiment. And the animation isn't working. There we go. Yeah. Uh, so for those of you familiar with X-rays, you've probably seen this cat falling many times. For those of you pro probably less familiar, here it is. And that's what we want to look at in our chemical reactions. So for example, what can you do? Well, you can look at dynamics of electronic coherence. And this was done, for example, with at a second X-ray Raman. Um, or you can look at spin dynamics. And this is a very interesting example of vibrational coherence in single molecule magnets, where you have three uh, manganese atoms, and you really want to understand how these single molecule magnets work. Another example is a charge transfer uh, charge transfer dynamics. And here, this is an analog of Prussian blue. You have a cobalt center and an iron center. And um, charge transfer is driven by ultrafast spin transition. So you want to look at spin electronic and structural change at the same time. So another example here would be exciton dynamics in uh, materials for photovoltaics. Uh, this one is exclusively organic, so you would need um, soft X-rays to look at what is happening here. As in any chemical reaction and in catalysis, you will have solvent-solute interaction dynamics. And again, we would love to look at it uh, in real time with uh, atomic resolution and femtosecond or even sub femtosecond uh, if you know if you're looking into some attoseconds phenomena resolution and closer to catalysis you can look directly at what is happening with plasmonic photocatalysts and you can interrogate um, changes in catalytic structure changes in the surfaces by using time resolved x-ray methods so what, what do we want? We want spin charge structure all at the same time. And 
Rebecca already mentioned multiple ranges uh, and multiple detection methods. So let me just give you a few examples of when it is useful. For example, you can look at correlated spin and structural dynamics. If you look at myoglobin and you can look at dissociation recombination of NO to the iron center in myoglobin. So here, uh, you would look at structures of short-lived intermediates by X-ray absorption and uh, wide angle X-ray scattering, and you can get spin information from X-ray emission. So this is uh, published in 2020, and as most papers in this area, it has a huge number of authors highly collaborative uh, from different groups in different countries. Oh, and I forgot to mention, if you have a figure number here, that refers to the figure in the uh, UK XFL science case on the web that John provided reference to. So what else can we look at? Uh, we can look at, for example, at uh, disulfide bonding in proteins. And this is some really very interesting work, which was showing dissociation of the disulfide bond. And what would be really nice to see then transfer this work directly into proteins and look at disulfide bond formation and breaking. Um, so the movie part we're looking at here is ligand dissociation as an you know, myoglobin, primary steps in protein dynamics, and primary steps in catalytic cycle. Applications would be for enzyme catalysis, photoprotection, drug target interactions, and we put here your science because whatever you're interested in for this particular uh, webinar, it's catalysis. There is a lot that can be gained from being able to monitor electronic structure and spin dynamics from the same sample in real time. So next would be for this part, for example, you can follow formation and breaking of hydrogen bonds or changes of electron density on the protein ligands. What we need for this is high sensitivity, high rep rate, and multiple detection correlative methods, and so on. Again, Rebecca already uh, mentioned uh, many of those methods. So let's move to uh, more basic molecules from big proteins to a small molecule which Probably everybody in photochemistry knows it's iron pentacarbonyl, um, but very recent study uh, using X-ray spectroscopy and element and site-specific probing allowed researchers to probe frontier orbital interactions upon ligand dissociation. So it was done by time-resolved resonance inelastic X-ray scattering, which is basically X-ray analog of resonance Raman scattering. And that was directed at iron L3H. So you can see how CO dissociates. And this is a prototypical molecule for a lot of organometallic chemistry. So in the movie part, we see ligand dissociation. Again, it's linked to primary steps in catalysis. And in the applications part, you can look at spin change, magnetic materials, fundamentals of chemical reactivity. Again, how fast, which steps, and you can map these very primary steps in, for example, catalysis. Um, another example uh, is more on the small molecules, although DNA is hardly a small molecule, but photochemistry of DNA bases, where with soft X-rays, you can look at carbon, nitrogen, or oxygen edges, and you can look at the photochemistry of DNA. And of course, if there is organic, uh, catalyst and homogeneous catalysis so that in principle is the same question. What is the structure of the catalyst um, in the course of the catalytic reaction? How is it changing? What's happening? Uh, you can combine this. It's all about combination of different methods and very fast time resolution. You can combine soft X-ray and hard X-rays. In principle, another prototype here is iron trees by pyridyl. Um, Iron trees by Pyridyl was investigated because there is a search for cheaper catalysts and cheaper photosensitizers, a prototypical 
photosensitizer trisrosinium by Peridel is very well studied, very useful, but unfortunately a little expensive. So there is a search of replacing expensive rare metals with not expensive and available. So that's the driving force from the application side to study iron trees by Peridel and using hard X-rays, uh, the cascade of spin orbit states in this molecule in this ion was resolved. So all of these applications go into areas of fundamental photochemistry, reaction mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera, photocatalysis, and anything you're interested in. If you're interested in spin electronic structural dynamics on the ultrafast time scale, even as the initial step in the process, which can take a rather long time, this is definitely a set of methods to look into. Uh, as an example uh, of how collaborative this field is, you can see an absolutely huge list of authors for the paper recently published in Nature on ultrafast structural changes uh, direct the first mo molecular events of vision. Uh, I, have a look, this is amazing, uh, but this combines groups from almost all light sources that John listed in his presentation. So it's got to be highly collaborative. And that's why we want to tell you about all the opportunities with the X-rays. So what they've discovered that um, there is a really fast component, one picosecond, and then a slightly slower component, which is over by 100 picoseconds in the primary events of vision. So finally, that's my last slide. If uh, you move to photocatalysis, then of course you would have a light absorber and potentially donor acceptor and catalysts. And if you look at the periodic table of X-rays, uh, then you can see all potential elements potentially involved in catalysis, elements involved in enzymatic action, semiconductors, and you can probe all of this with X-rays. I want to bring back the example Rebecca has shown on this molecular wire where multiple X-ray methods were used and multiple X-ray regions can also be used to look at um, dynamics of the system. So you can understand and then control catalytic reactions. And you can combine X-rays with infrared and terahertz excitation and detection. This will uniquely allow you to catch low energy reaction coordinates, so slow frequency modes, which you can't really catch otherwise in real time. You can combine X-ray with electron beams, which will give you unique access to charged reaction intermediates, and you can interrogate them in real time. Or you can combine methods, and there are all sorts of abbreviations here. Some of them Rebecca mentioned, some of them Andrew will mention in a few seconds. But the take home message is you can combine different X ray methods with different uh, excitation sources. And you can, in principle, do it in multicolor, multi dimensional way. And you can get a comprehensive, this is a dream, is right? Comprehensive picture of the dynamics of your system in one shot. So I'll stop now and I'll uh, hand over to Andrew. Thank you very much. So hopefully you can see my slides. Yes. Excellent. Right, so um, what I'll be talking about is um, specifically using terahertz and IR pumping combined with X-ray techniques to understand molecular and chemical systems and try and steer um, and give ideas about how that could be used in, potentially um, in catalysis. So when I talk about IR and terahertz, I'm going to use very specific definitions of those because we're going to look at slightly different um, pumping mechanisms. So when I'm talking about a terahertz pump, I'm usually talking about something below 650 wave numbers, so 20 terahertz. Um, and when I talk about infrared, I'm talking about beginning at 10 terahertz. So there's an overlap between them. I'm trying to differentiate these because when I'm talking about terahertz, I'm pumping energy into the lowest available modes in that material. 
Whereas when I'm talking about infrared pumping, I'm pumping those into higher energy vibrational modes and using that to couple energy into different parts of the system. The key with a lot of this is that what you're doing is you're pumping lev energy levels that are responsible for your reaction coordinate. And these levels are available through thermal heating. But what you're doing is you're putting a lot of energy into these systems in order to try and initiate and control your reactions. And one of the really exciting things about x valves is that you would be able to have very, very powerful sources in this region coupled to X-ray sources so that you could pump in these regions and then probe um, with X-ray sources with all the techniques that we've already heard about. So in particular, with a terahertz and an IR pump, as an alternative to an optical pump. In an optical pump, what you're doing is you're interacting with electronic states and that exerts forces on nuclear indirectly. So what you often do is you put a whole load of energy in and hope for the best. And in some cases that just causes a large amount of heating that you maybe don't want. So what you should be able to do with terahertz and IR pumping if designed in an appropriate way is to directly drive electro electric dipole Vib active vibrational modes, and that exerts forces directly onto the nuclei and can lead to a much better level of control. From the X-ray side of things, we've already heard a lot about this, but from the key aspect from this part of the talk is that you're directly getting structural information from the probes rather than inferring that from spectral measurements that we might do if we cover a terahertz pump with a terahertz probe or a terahertz pump with an optical probe. There's a really nice quote from Peter Ham a few years ago that says, direct control of the orientation of molecules adsorbed on a catalytic surface, thereby inducing a catalytic reaction would be a beautiful example of an, an especially direct realization of the very idea of femtochemistry. So these, this hardware that we're proposing could really revolutionize how to control these systems and lead to molecular movies and a greater understanding in this field. To give you an indication of why we might be particularly interested in terahertz pumping, this is just one example I've put, pulled from a few years ago, and these are DFT animations from um, various low frequency vibrations in CIF-8, but really these kind of vibrations are involved in, in lots of the MOFs or other modern materials that we might be looking at for catalytic materials. And if we can both probe, but also pump particular motions, particularly if you say, look at this one terahertz motion, that's a ringed breathing mode uh, uh, where gas storage or, 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 or where a catalytic site might happen in the, in the center of that molecule. And you would be able to, by pumping energy into that, be able to maybe initiate or control a specific reaction. There has already been some work looking at terahertz pumping and then probing with various techniques. Um, but often a lot of this work is still in its infancy and nearly all of the work to date that's been published is on the strontium titanate or, or similar types of materials. Um, and that's largely because we have a, a nice simple crystalline system with a, a single phonon mode at terahertz frequencies that's very soft and has a, a great variability with temperature, which makes it a perfect initial material. So a few years ago, there were two papers that came out in the same edition of Science, um, looking at pumping this strontium titanate. One pumped at low frequency terahertz region of the spectra, and what you see is a very, very rapid change in the crystalline structure initiated by the vibration, um, which causes a, a, a ferroelectric um, material to form that's not stable normally, um, and you, but this drifts off over a few picoseconds. However, in the second paper, what they did is they pumped at a much higher frequency mode at 20 terahertz. That pumped more energy into the system, which then coupled to the low frequency mode. So they said they instead showed the same ferroelectric state being induced, but this system in, in turn was um, stable for several minutes. So you're starting to form metastable states that wouldn't be able to um, be found otherwise and exploring the potential energy of the landscape of this system. Both of these systems were then probed with optical probes to be able to detect that. So you're not seeing the structural information directly. In later work, um, 
a different group looked at the same pumping regime as one of the science papers, but this time probing with, with x-rays and were able to not only see the ferroelectric state, but to monitor where the energy went in the system and show the nonlinear coupling between the, the low frequency mode that was pumped and higher frequency modes in the system. And they were able to do that by, by looking at the structural scattering and looking at the distortions in the crystal structure. And then very recently on archive, we've we, uh, uh, similar process again, pumping at similar frequencies, but this time using a circularly polarized light. So we've seen, seen multiferocity in the system and, and different states being formed. But all of these show the potential to be able to pump energy into systems like this, be able to couple energy into the modes that you want and be able to look at how that energy is coupled and where that energy goes and hopefully use that to eventually either induce new states or induce new reactivity. So there have been examples where we've been proposed or looked at or simulated for catalytic surfaces. And one of the key points here is that often if you're wanting to do a time resolved catalysis, you might pump with an optical pump, which generates a lot of electrons. And then you're requiring, you're hoping that those electrons will then couple into other modes that then initiate or start reactions. So you could with a terahertz pump directly probe phonons in a system or with an IR pump pump um, various vibrations in your molecule and get the energy exactly where you want. This simulation that's moving over the right is a um, molecular dynamic simulation of a single car um, carbon monoxide molecule on a catalytic surface. And as the, you pump at zero um, picoseconds, you see the molecule oscillate and then that oscillation grows and then dies down as you turn the pump off after five femtoseconds. Um, what you'd be able to do is initiate, put energy into the molecules on the surface with your initial pump, and then use various hard or soft X-ray probes to probe either the molecule on the surface or the surface itself, or look at homogeneous catalysis that's been discussed previously. There has been one example where we've looked at terahertz pumping and X-ray probing and a catalytic surface by LaRue in 2015. Well, they showed if the, you just had carbon monoxide on a ruthenium surface and looked at that surface with or without terahertz, the terahertz had no effect and the carbon monoxide was still stuck contained on the surface. But if you mixed and put oxygen on the surface so that you have both, then the terahertz probe did affect the amount of materials on the surface, and you've got a selective catalytic oxidation of one material versus the other. The concept behind this is simply that when you hit with the terahertz, what you're actually doing is you're using the terahertz as a very ultra fast electric field, which increases the antibonding character of the ruthenium oxygen bond. It lengthens this bond and weakens it and changes the reactivity of the series. So you're not actually directly pumping a pro phonon, but rather using the terahertz pump as a very, very high, very, very short electric field. And this shows great promise for the future in combining these techniques as higher end facilities with greater terahertz power and higher repetition rates proceed. As an idea for a potential application, so um, thank you to Ian and Jason at York who shared a slide with me on their materials, but they look at homogeneous catalysis and at the moment they're using UV pump IR probe over a large degree of um, uh, large variations of time. And what they're doing with this material is they're basically using the IR probes to probe the carbon ion in this material and then inferring structural changes and identifying and the time profiles of various intermediates along the way. So they're able to use these techniques to observe various intermediate states in a catalytic reaction in challenging environments. But they're light stimulating and they've really particularly chosen this material because it has carbon ions and carbon ions act as a really nice handy probe in the IR. But these initiations could be done by pumping into these IR modes or even pumping into terahertz modes, putting terahertz energy into the solvent, which they've shown would directly couple. And the X-ray probes would really allow them to probe individual metallic sites or individual carbon or nitrogen edges and really pull structural information and get extra information, both from a control point of view um, and from a structural probing point of view. I'm going to have to wait for my PowerPoint to. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, PowerPoint has just crashed. Um, but the last slide from me 
was really just going to describe the benefits and emphasize the benefits of terahertz um, pumping at being able to control where the energy goes into your initial system uh, or with IR it's a pumping at higher frequencies and allowing that energy to couple into those low frequency modes and as emphasized by others the x-ray probing would allow you to look at particular edges or particular iron metal centers and really get structural information so I'll now pass over to Tom who will be able to talk about um, the theory aspects of this work Tom, you're still muted. There we yes, go. I just I just clicked the unmute button. I was just waiting a couple of seconds because I'm by the hospital and I just had a, 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 a ambulance go past. So just at the right time. Uh, so yeah, um, so I suppose uh, a slight slight change of tact here because uh, obviously, hopefully, this will be not a theoretical machine but a, a real machine. Um, and so this this is this is more about the. Uh, um, I suppose in some ways a call to arms about what theory needs to do to work alongside the rapid development in, in experiments in this field and what kind of um, things that we need to be able to compute. And so, you know, as has been highlighted already, uh, XFELs, especially the high, high uh, rep rate machines that are beginning to merge, are really delivering highly detailed information about the electronic and geometric structure of matter. And now we're able to probe on the femtosecond timescale but what we really need to know is how can we efficiently and accurately analyze this huge amount of data? And it's not just a problem for X files, but you know, exactly um, um, other facilities that are emerging with high data uh, acquisition rates, this represents a problem. Okay. So, so from a perspective of theory, what, what, are the, what are the kind of key challenges? Well, now we're, we're moving into a domain uh, going beyond the picosecond or, or even quasi-static regime, where we can really probe the ultra-fast dynamics. As has already been mentioned, we can see coupling between the electronic and nuclear uh, degrees of freedom that go beyond the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. With uh, high photon numbers, we can have a better insight into disorder and also potentially also probe these rare events, uh, the, the minor reaction channels that maybe are detrimental to a particular reaction or, or um, that cause degradation or, uh, or, or even uh, positive. And so from this, uh, if we're looking at X-ray spectroscopy, one of the things we have to take into account now is that we, we not only need the... Uh, the absorption cross-section for a valence excited state or the cross-section of a core excited state uh, to calculate the spectrum, but we need uh, the cross-section of a core excited valence excited state in these paint pump probes. So we're looking at two electron processes, um, which in, uh, makes uh, uh, things a bit more complicated. We also have to include the effects of this non-adiabatic or non born polymer effects. And we have to be able to translate these simulations across a wide variety of time and length scales into the spectroscopic observable. And this is really key. The X-ray in the X-ray domain, whether it's spectroscopy or scattering, contains a huge amount of information. But, but to be able to extract that, we really have to have a strong synergy between uh, simulation and uh, an experiment. A good example for this is uh, X-ray solution scattering, which kind of got an example here of where the X-rays obviously scatter off everything. Uh, and so we may have a signal that's associated with a solute, some molecule or material that's dissolved. Um, we will then have a component where the, the X-rays are scattering purely off the solvent. Okay, And so once we've started some reaction, that solvent will respond. We may be interested in that or it uh, may not be so interested in that. But then they also have a cage term. So the solvent molecule is directly around the solute. And we know that this kind of solvation process has a strong impact on reactivity. Um, and really to be able to extract um, each component accurately, especially the first two, we need to be able to perform accurate molecular dynamics. Uh, in some cases, we even have to understand how the electron density changes influences the scattering amplitude. And then we have to be able to sample all the possible reaction pathways to sum up and, and, and get that agreement with the experimental uh, data to interpret. Otherwise, the, the, a lot of this experimental data 
is is uh, would be interpretative qual uh, qualitatively, and so we we wouldn't get the full value out of it. So just um, uh, you've already seen snapshots of this. Just going through a few examples of where X, um, kind of theory has been used. Uh, so Julia already mentioned the uh, uh, the ligand exchange dynamics of FeCO5. Um, from the perspective of theory, what was done here is take individual snapshots of what was deemed as critical points on a potential energy surface, and then these these will compute each of these geometries were used to compute the spectra, and then which were then compared to the experimental spectra. Okay. So these snapshots, as I said, can be used uh, to interpret the femtosecond dynamics, although the connection between them uh, at this stage is, is still lacking. Okay. And, and in part, this is because of the challenging nature of these simulations. Each one of these quantum chemistry calculations takes about um, 800 CPU hours, just because of the nature um, of the, uh, the computation. Um, in a in a more uh, catalysis setting, we've been looking at bond breaking and making on uh, on surfaces. Um, so Andrew has already mentioned this. In this case, it was UV excitation uh, to initiate the dissociation of CO from a ruthenium surface. Um, and particularly focusing on the simulations here, the density functional simulations were used to calculate the potential and the interaction between the surface and the molecule and identify potential. Uh, barriers or transition states that could be used to uh, to interpret the kinetics and the dynamics um, um, obtained. Um, so both of these are obviously very uh, very useful and interesting simulations, but that, as I said, as I said, kind of lack the uh, the dynamical insight. Um, so more recently, um, uh, some dynamics uh, X-ray absorption used to um, investigate the dynamics of a copper phenantholine complex in which quantum dynamic simulation could be um, uh, converted into the experimental observable uh, directly and used to predict and guide the experiment. Uh, and, and in this case, the, uh, the theory was able to have a good match with the experiment and, and identify the oscillations and the source of, of each of these oscillations in here, which are different components of the wave packet dynamics, essentially sh shedding light onto what is the reaction coordinate. A similar, a similar example was, uh, was recently done in the ring opening dyna dynamics of thiophenone, in which uh, excited state molecular dynamics simulation could be used to identify uh, the, the products after photo excitation. And what's interesting here is that the molecule is excited and then relaxes very quickly to its ground state, but is very vibrationally hot. And that, vibe, that excess energy means that it's able to search a larger region of the potential energy surface and form a wide variety of different uh, products in, involving this kind of triangle form, hydrogen transfer form. And only by actually performing these simulations and then calculating the binding energy, in this case it was XUV, um, it could um, sum them together in their relative magnitudes from the molecular dynamics and use these to interpret the experimental signal. So one of the one of the kind of so this shows the potential of of both static and also dynamical theoretical simulations to really drive the analysis of um of, of these experiments that are pushing the limits of what's possible. I suppose one of the challenges that it's really is that a lot of these are are quite computationally expensive. A lot of resources goes into computing all of these many geometries at the various timescales. Um, and so quite recently. Uh, there's been work on using uh, uh, machine learning enhanced techniques. So in this case, it's a ring opening uh, applied to the ring opening of dithiane. And what was done in this case is that uh, as the molecular dynamics were run at each time step, um, data from the uh, 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 spectral calculations were taken and taken it um, and used to predict a neural network. This neural network could then predict the spectral at all remaining time steps. And essentially, this cycle was iteratively improved until uh, there was enough, the, the neural network had enough data to be able to predict the remaining experimental signal. And this is an example here. So for the first 900 femtoseconds, the first 110 femtoseconds is actually white because that's the data that's being used to train. 
Um, and after that, the neural network is able to reproduce pretty well um, the first principles calculation. So there are many opportunities for kind of machine learning enhanced um, 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 analysis of X-ray data, especially in these resource intensive where you have uh, the dynamics and many possible outcomes. Uh, but it doesn't just stop at the analysis or as soon as the, the photon hits the detector, there are opportunities to, uh, to exploit data science techniques to, uh, um, to leverage improvement. Okay, so an example here, just um, for looking at the conversion of uh, gold oxide to gold um, through X-ray spectroscopy, but just a brief summary that the, you know, the opportunities from X-Files are, are really significant to push the experimental insight that we can gain. Um, theory is playing an important role in this in helping to extract all the amount of information from this data. Um, and this goes right from across the time and length scales uh, typically used by uh, computational chemists, but really it's uh, the key is translating the simulations into these, these experimental observables. And so I think that just leads me to pass back to, uh, to John uh, to, uh, to wrap up. Well, thank you, Tom, and thanks to everybody. Um, let me just share my screen one last time to, 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 to finish this off. Um, uh, okay, let me try and hide my presentation so first of all let me say that uh, you can read about many of these examples in the uh, UK XFL science case which is available online at the address given here uh, www.xfl.ac.uk and um, I, I think it's true to say that we feel, and I hope you share to some extent this feeling, there are exciting opportunities emerging. And if you want to learn more or get actively involved in experiments or the process of updating the science and technology case, feel free to get in touch with us, uh, with the members of the chemical sciences team, which in addition to the people who were presenting today include Russell uh, Mins, uh, Sophia Diaz Moreno, Mark Gruard, uh, Claire Valence, as well as 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 well as uh, Tom, Julia, um, Andrew, and uh, I, I missed Andrew's address off here, but uh, I, I meant to include them all. Um, and uh, and and just to advertise, um, we have a number of plans already um, fixed for developing the science and technology case through various community engagement activities. So to follow up on this webinar. Um, in association with the Catalysis Hub, we're planning an in-person uh, workshop on the Harwell campus, and the date for that is set for November the 6th, so I hope that you'll be able to participate in that. We, we, we're still uh, reaching out to, to, to potential speakers to, to join in that, so we might well approach some of you. Um, next week on Thursday, we have a workshop looking at the application of XFELs to studying fast um, radiation and charged particle induced uh, processes um, of, with iron and electron beams. Um, and that will take place at Manchester University in the Schuster building um, on the 18th of May, that's next Thursday. And it's not too late to register. I think there are still spaces available for that. So if you want to find, if you want to get, a, uh, get this link, just drop me an email and I can forward it to you. And then as well as that, we are planning a series of town hall events around the UK, each associated with an area specific workshop uh, matching to the science and technology case um, uh, themes. And they're going to happen around the UK over the next 18 months. And let me give you a quick summary of the ones that are already established and also the ones that are a little bit further out. So the first is in Belfast on the 20th and 21st of June, um, where we're looking at frontiers of measurement technology. Uh, the next is in uh, University of Strathclyde, in fact, on the 2nd and 3rd of October, looking at materials, chemistry and biology at extreme conditions. The third, which will be hosted uh, at the University of Plymouth um, on sometime in mid late January uh, next year, is going to be focused on AI, quantum computing, and fundamental physics. And then after that, subsequent meetings will be in Sheffield on energy, environmental, and climate technologies, in Manchester on electronic 
products photonics and quantum technologies in uh in, uh, probably at diamond on engineering biology genomics and healthcare and 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 also one plan for wales a venue still to be set on uh, advanced manufacturing so with that, um, I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen. And uh, I think there is time for questions if any of you have questions, but otherwise let me thank you for joining in today. Thank you very much for fascinating roundup of, of XFEL. Um, we've got questions coming in, so I'll read them out. Um, so a really exciting webinar and many thanks. It shows the exciting opportunities of Excel and catalytic science. Almost all areas of the field, heterogeneous, homogeneous and biocatalysis will benefit from these new capabilities. Um, allowing us to probe real, realistic reactions. It's also a tremendous opportunity for interaction of theory and modeling. So I, I, don't, I don't see a question in there. I think it's more um, a summary. <laughs> If there are any more questions, please type them into the Q&A. Um, I have a, a quick question, it's slightly off piece maybe, but if there are people on the webinar who maybe haven't used Excel before, how's the, the best way to get involved and get to one of these facilities? I think that's a great question. And I, I actually think it's it's something that, you know, as a as a as a as a team, we're very focused on because we're very aware of the fact that these are new types of technology, new types of uh, measurement method. And there's quite a barrier to, 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 to applying those for the first time. It's very hard to get beam time. So the, the, the natural way to do it and the way I think we all started is to go along to somebody else's beam time and learn a bit about it and, 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 and get involved and then be ready to put in your own proposals and hopefully successful proposals to get beam time. So this is one of the reasons I say reach out to us, you know, those email addresses we put in, uh, Andrew's as well. I'm sorry, I forgot that. Um, uh, and or, or to the wider science team, because, of course, there are people in related areas in physics and in quantum materials and dense matter physics who many of you will have overlaps with who, who will be getting beam times and will be looking for collaborations and 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 the like. So I think it, it, it's there's also two. Um, very important um, organizations funded by STFC. Um, Diamond hosts the uh, Life Sciences uh, XFEL Hub, and, and that's run by Alan Orville, very successfully getting people involved in beam times and helping them get established in the game. And at the same time, there's a physical sciences hub run uh, at the Central Laser Facility by James Green, uh, which has been successful in encouraging people to get involved in part by funding studentships and, and the like and, and travel to, to beam times. So there are some opportunities out there. I think, you know, we would comment that our normal funders, in my case, the EPSRC, are funding grants to work on free electron lasers or to do work with free electron lasers. So I think there is there is um, uh, within the UKRI system uh, significant support available for those who want to, to seek it. But please reach out to us and discuss with us what you're interested in doing, and and uh, and, and and we'll see if you we can we can help. Okay, thank you. Um, I've had no more questions come in on the Q and A. It may be just that we're we're a bit over the hour. Yeah, I apologise um, for that. <laughs> no, no, it's just too much information. <laughs> um, but we hope that the people still online can join us on the sixth to have a, a good discussion um, about catalysis and XFL. Sixth uh, of November, that is. <laughs> um, and if there are no further questions, I will close the webinar. I'll say thanks to all our speakers. Um, it's been very, very interesting. And we look forward to having more discussions in November. Thank you, Josie. And bye. Thank bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.